Welcome to 2024 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Welcome to lesson number 12, titled Worship That Never Ends, ready for teaching on March 23. It's from the series of Sabbath School lessons titled Psalms and is authored by Dr. Dragoslava Sentrak and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, March 16. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that from eternity you have been worth worshipping that you deserve worship. And as we open your word this week to study about this, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us, that each of us may be blessed, that your word may speak to us in such a way that our lives will be solidified in the knowledge that what comes from the Psalms are messages that are a blessing for us and for our families, for our churches, for our communities. And as we open your word this week, I just want to pray for those who are listening in various parts of the world, for Lydia La Fortune in Trinidad and Tobago and Norla Xavier in the Dominican Republic and for Geraldine in the USA. And for those who are listening in Victoria Point in Queensland and Auckland, New Zealand and Suva in Fiji and Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea and Honiara in the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. Lord, people are listening on every continent and We just pray that wherever we are listening, that you will be with us to bless us and to guide us. Help us with our own families, with our own needs, but also help us as we share your word with those around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Psalm 104 and verse 33. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Psalm 104, verse 33. Let's read that again. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. As our experience of God's grace and power increases, we are prompted to ask with the psalmist, In Psalm 116, verse 12, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? The inevitable reply is to devote one's life to being faithful to God. In Psalms, Israel is not simply a nation, but the great assembly, as we read in Psalm 22, verses 22 to 25. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But When he cried to him, he heard, My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. And Psalm 35, verse 18, I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. This reveals Israel's primary calling to praise God and to bear witness about him to other nations because the Lord wants all the world to join his people in worship. The Lord's people are identified with the righteous who worship the Lord and whose hope is in him and in his love. Praising the Lord in the congregation is perceived as ideal worship. This does not mean that the prayer and praise of the individual in Israel assume a secondary meaning. By contrast, the individual's worship of God feeds the communal worship with renewed praise, as we read in Psalm 22, while in turn, individual worship develops its fullest potential in close relationship with the community. The worshipping community also is called the assembly of the upright in Psalm 111 verse 1. The upright know God, as we read in Psalm 36 verse 10, O continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright 
in heart and are known by God in Psalm 37, 18. The Lord knows the days of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. And this experience permeates every aspect of their existence. Sunday, March 17. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary. Read Psalm 134. Where is the worship offered here? What is the outcome of the worship of the Lord? Psalm 134, beginning at verse 1. Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. Psalm 134 recalls the Aaronic priestly blessing in Numbers 6, 24 to 26, and also expressed in Psalm 67 and verse 1. Well, first of all, let's look at Numbers chapter 6, beginning at verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And also Psalm 67 verse 1, God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. And this highlights the blessing as the underlying principle and outcome of the relationship between God and Israel. The people bless God in the sanctuary and God blesses his people from Zion. The blessings extend to all of life because the Lord is the creator of heaven and earth. The mention of Zion as the place of divine special blessings underlines the Lord's covenantal bond with his people. It is thus within the covenant of grace that Israel exercises the privilege to bless the Lord and is blessed by him. Read Psalm 18, 1, 36-1, 113-1, 134-1 and 2, and 135-1 and 2. How are the worshippers depicted here at the beginning of each of these psalms? First of all, Psalm 18, verse 1, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. And Psalm 36, verse 1, an oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked, there is no fear of God before his eyes. And Psalm 113, verse 1, Praise the Lord, praise, O servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. And Psalm 134, verses 1 and 2, Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. And Psalm 135, verses 1 and 2, Praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, praise him, O you servants of the Lord, you who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. So how are the worshippers depicted here? The Psalms often depict the worshippers as the servants of the Lord, who, as it says in Psalm 134 verse 1, by night stand in the house of the Lord. And this likely refers to the night guards of the Levites, which we read about in 1 Chronicles 9, 23 to 27. So they and their children are in charge of the gates of the house of the Lord, the house of the tabernacle, by assignment. The gatekeepers were assigned to the four directions, the east, west, north, and south, and their brethren in their villages had to come with them from time to time for seven days. For in this trusted office were four chief gatekeepers, they were Levites, and they had charge over the chambers of the treasuries of the house of God, and they lodged all between the house of God because they had the responsibility and they were in charge of opening it every morning. 
or to the praise that was offered to God by the Levites both day and night, as you read in 1 Chronicles 9, verse 33. These are the singers, heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites, who lodged in the chambers and were free from other duties, for they were employed in that work day and night. Because the Israelites worshipped the invisible God, who could not be represented in the form of any image, The sanctuary served to reflect the glory of the Lord and provide a secure environment for sinful people to approach their holy king. This encounter is initiated by the Lord himself and is regulated by his statutes and decrees. As we read in 1 Peter 2 verses 4 and 5, coming to him as to a living stone rejected indeed by men, but Chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What we see here in the words of Peter is a New Testament expression of the same ideas presented in these Psalms, that of God's people now a holy priesthood, offering praise and thanksgiving to their Lord Jesus Christ, their Creator and Redeemer, for all the good things that He had done for them. And so to finish today, as New Testament believers, we also have a priestly role in that we are called to mediate the good news of the gospel to the world. What are the most effective ways we can do this? Monday, March 18, sing to the Lord a new song. Read Psalm 33, 3, 40, verse 3, 96, verse 1, 98, verse 1, 144, verse 9, and Psalm 149, verse 1. What is the common motif in these texts? Psalm 33, verse 3, sing to him a new song, play skillfully with a shout of joy. And Psalm 40, verse 3, he has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. And Psalm 96, and verse 1, O sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. And Psalm 98, verse 1, O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. And Psalm 144, verse 9, I will sing a new song to you, O God. On a harp of ten strings I will sing praise to you. And Psalm 149, verse 1, Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the assembly of the saints. These psalms summon people to sing a new song. What is a new song here? The reason for the new song is the fresh recognition of the Lord's majesty and sovereignty over the world and gratitude for his care and salvation as the creator and judge of the earth. Deliverance from enemies and from death and God's special favour toward Israel are some of the more personal motives to sing a new song. While other songs also praise the Lord for his loving kindness and wonders, the new song is a special song, expressing rekindled joy and promising renewed devotion to God. The new experience of divine deliverance inspires the people to acknowledge the Lord as their creator and king. The common themes in the Psalms that tell of a new song are trust in God, praise of his wonderful works, and deliverance from affliction, among other things. Read Isaiah 42, verses 10 to 12, Revelation 5, verse 9, and Revelation 14, verse 3. What can we infer about the new song from these biblical texts? First of all, Isaiah 42, beginning at verse 10. 
Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise from the ends of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you coastlands and you inhabitants of them. Let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voice, the villages that Kedah inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Selah sing. Let them shout from the tops of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. And Revelation 5 verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And Revelation 14 verse 3, They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. God's people, Israel, is depicted in affectionate terms as a people near to him in Psalm 148 verse 14, implying that of all the creation, Israel has the most special status and thus is most obliged and privileged to praise God. The Bible thus encourages believers of all generations to sing the new song in praise of their Redeemer, which carries their unique testimony about salvation in the blood of the Lamb. A new song can depict a fresh song that no one has ever heard before, a song that commemorates a vivid experience of God's grace in one's life. The new song can also express hope, in which case the newness of the song is demonstrated in the anticipation of the unique, unprecedented experience of God's majesty in the future. True worship goes beyond sacrifices and offerings and reflects a living relationship with God that is always fresh and dynamic. In a sense, one could simply say that the new song is a new expression, even each day, of our love and appreciation for what God has done for us. And so to finish the day, dwell on God's blessings in your life. If you were to sing a new song, what would it be? Tuesday, March 19. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Read Psalm 15. Who are the people worthy of worshipping in God's presence? Psalm 15, beginning at verse 1. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbour nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honours those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change, he who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent, he who does these things shall never be moved." The answer given in this psalm is the summary of the requirements already given in God's law and the prophets. The ones whose actions, that's works or righteousness and character in his heart, are a reflection of God. As we read in Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your strength. And Micah 6, verses 6 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The sanctuary was a holy place, and everything in it, including the priests, was consecrated. 
Thus, holiness is a mandatory requirement for entering the presence of God. Israel's holiness was to be comprehensive, uniting worship with ethics and exercised in all aspects of life. The law was given to God's people to enable them to fulfill their greatest potential, that is, live as a kingdom of priests. The royal priesthood includes a life of holiness in the presence of God and bringing the covenant blessings to other nations. Read Psalm 24, verses 3 to 6, and Psalm 101, verses 1 to 3. What does it mean to be holy? Psalm 24, beginning at verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Salah and Psalm 101, beginning at verse 1. I will sing of mercy and justice to you, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perfect heart is the worshipper's greatest quality before God. The Hebrew tamim, T-A-M-I-M, perfect, conveys the notion of completeness and wholeness. A perfect vine is whole, undamaged and healthy, as you read in Ezekiel chapter 15 verse 5. Indeed, when it was whole, no object could be made from it. How much less will it be useful for any work when the fire has devoured it and it is burned? Animals offered as sacrifices had to be tamim or without blemish, as we read in Leviticus 22 verses 1 to 4. And whoever offers a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord to fulfill his vow, or a freewill offering from the cattle or the sheep, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. Those that are blind or broken or maimed or have an ulcer or eczema or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar of the Lord. Either a bull or a lamb that has any lamb too long or too short, you may offer as a freewill offering, but for a vow it shall not be accepted. You shall not offer to the Lord what is bruised or crushed or torn or cut, nor shall you make any offering of them in your land." Perfect speech is entirely truthful. We read in Job 36 and verse 4, For truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. A perfect heart thus is a pure heart, as we read in Psalm 24 verse 4. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, or a heart of integrity, as we read in Psalm 15 verse 2. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. It seeks God, as we read in Psalm 24, verse 6. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Selah, and is restored by God's forgiveness, as we read in Psalm 51, verses 2 to 10. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, 
and renew a steadfast spirit within me. A blameless life springs from the acknowledgement of God's grace and His righteousness. Divine grace inspires and enables God's servants to live in the fear of the Lord, which means to live in unhindered fellowship with God and in submission to His word. A testimony of a devoted and pious life brings praise to God and not to one's own self. Notice that most requirements in Psalm 15 are given in negative terms. As we read in Psalm 15, verses 3 to 5, He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbour, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honours those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change, he who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent, he who does these things shall never be moved. This is not about earning God's favour, but about avoiding the things that would separate us from God. And so to finish today, how can we make conscious choices to avoid the things that push us away from God? What are some of those things and how Can we avoid doing them? Wednesday, March 20, Declare His Glory Among the Nations Read Psalm 96. What manifold aspects of worship are mentioned in this psalm? Psalm 96, beginning at verse 1. O sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens, honour and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples, give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his court. So worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Worship includes singing to the Lord, as we read in verses 1 and 2, praising his name in verse 2, proclaiming his goodness and greatness in verses 3 and 4, and bringing gifts to his temple in verse 8. In addition to these familiar traits of worship, Psalm 96 highlights one not-so-obvious aspect of worship, the evangelical dimension in proclaiming the Lord's kingdom to other people in verses 2, 3 and 10. Yet singing, praising, bringing gifts and proclaiming the gospel are not separate actions, but are varied expressions of worship. The proclamation of God's salvation to all nations gives substance to praise and content to worship. Notice how the reasons for worship coincide with the message proclaimed to other peoples. For the Lord is great, in verse 4, for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens, in verse 5, and in verse 10, the Lord reigns, and for he is coming to judge the earth, in verse 13. Thus, the goal of evangelism is to unite other peoples with God's people, and ultimately the whole creation in the worship of the Lord, as we read in verses 11 to 13. Worship springs from the inward recognition of who the Lord is, that is, Creator, King, 
and judge in verses 5, 10 and 13. Worship thus involves remembering God's past acts, creation, celebrating his present wonders, God's sustaining of the world and his present reign, and anticipating his future deeds, end time judgment and a new life in a new heavens and earth. Judgment in the Psalms means restoration of the divine order of peace, justice and well-being in a world presently burdened by injustice and suffering. Hence, the whole earth rejoices in anticipation of God's judgments in verses 10 to 13, and we'll compare that with Psalm 98 verses 4 to 9. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. The fact that the Lord is a righteous judge should additionally motivate people to worship him in holiness and tremble and should caution them against taking worship lightly, as it said in verse 9. Worship involves both immense joy and confidence, as we read in verses 1 and 2 and 11, 12 and 13, and holy fear and awe in verses 4 and 9. The universal appeal of Psalm 96 to worship the Creator and the Judge is reflected in God's final gospel proclamation to the world, the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. In many ways, this psalm seems to incorporate this end-time message, creation, salvation, the everlasting gospel, worship and judgment. It's all there. And so to finish today, compare this psalm with the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 verses 6 to 12. In what ways does it teach the same basic truths as does this end-time message that we are to proclaim to the world? And so we finish with Revelation 14, beginning at verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends for ever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith. Of Jesus. Thursday, March 21. When God does not delight in sacrifices. Read Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8, Psalm 50, verses 7 to 23, and Psalm 51, verses 16 to 19. What important issue do these texts address? Why does God not delight in the sacrifices that he prescribed in his word? In Exodus 20, verse 24. Exodus 20, verse 24 reads, An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you, and I will bless you. 
So we read Psalm 40, and we begin at verse 6. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, my ears you have opened, burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. And Psalm 50, verses 7 to 23. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked God says, What right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him, and have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you, and set them in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God. Lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. And Psalm 51, verses 16 to 19. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Like the prophets, the psalmist decry various misuses of worship. Their main point in these verses, is not the Lord's aversion to Israel's sacrifices and festivals, but the reasons for such repugnance, the fatal distance between worship and spirituality. God is not rebuking his people for their sacrifices and burnt offerings, but for their wickedness and acts of injustice that they had done in their personal lives, as we saw in verse 8 of Psalm 50 and verses 17 to 21 of Psalm 50. The Psalms are not preaching against sacrifice and worship, but against vain sacrifice and empty worship demonstrated in the unrighteousness of these worshippers. When the unity between the outward expression of worship and the correct inner motivation for worship falls apart, rituals usually become more important in and of themselves than does the actual experience of drawing close to God. Come an end in themselves as opposed to the God whom these rituals are supposed to point to and to reveal. Read John chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. What point is Jesus making here that fits exactly with what the Psalms for today are warning about? Jesus speaking in John chapter 4, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Sacrifices alone are not enough. 
What good were these sacrifices if the hearts of those offering them were not filled with repentance, faith, and a sorrow for sin? Only when, accompanied by repentance and sincere thanksgiving, could the sacrifices of bulls please God as sacrifices of righteousness, as we read in Psalm 51 verse 19. We also can see this in Psalm 50 verse 14, Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Jesus, quoting Isaiah, expressed it like this, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Matthew 15 verse 8 The problems the psalmists saw were the same problems that Jesus encountered with some of the people, especially the leaders during his earthly ministry. And so to finish the day, How can we make sure that we, as Adventists, with all this light and knowledge, don't fall into the trap of thinking that merely knowing truth and going through the rituals of truth is enough? Friday, March 22. If you have the book, A Call to Stand Apart, there's a recommendation here to read How to Pray on pages 39 to 42. But let's continue with the lesson pamphlet. Central to worship is the need for repentance, true repentance. Repentance includes sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness. Until we turn away from it in heart, there will be no real change in the life. In Steps to Christ, pages 22 and 23, Ellen White writes, There are many who fail to understand the true nature of repentance. Multitudes sorrow that they have sinned and even make an outward reformation because they fear that their wrongdoing will bring suffering upon themselves. But this is not repentance in the Bible sense. They lament the suffering rather than the sin. Such was the grief of Esau when he saw that the birthright was lost to him forever. Balaam Terrified by the angel standing in his pathway with drawn sword, acknowledged his guilt lest he should lose his life. But there was no genuine repentance for sin, no conversion of purpose, no abhorrence of evil. Judas Iscariot, after betraying his Lord, exclaimed in Matthew 27 verse 4, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. End of quote. And then another quote, this time from Prophets and Kings, page 50. Although God dwells not in temples made with hands, yet he honours with his presence the assemblies of his people. He has promised that when they come together to seek him, to acknowledge their sins and to pray for one another, he will meet with them by his Spirit. But those who assemble to worship him should put away every evil thing. Unless they worship him in spirit and truth and in the beauty of holiness, their coming together will be of no avail. Of such the Lord declares in Matthew fifteen eight and 9, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him, we read in John four twenty three. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, what is the worshipper's greatest offering to God? Well we read Psalm forty and verses six to ten sacrifice and offering you did not desire my ears you have opened burnt offering and sin offering you did not require then i said behold i come in the scroll of the book it is written of me i delight to do your will o my god and your law is within my heart I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord, you yourself know. 
I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. And then Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God." And discussion question number two, how are individual and communal worship related? Why do we need both? How does each one enhance the other? And three, many people understand worship to pertain only to prayer, singing of hymns and study of the Bible and spiritual literature. While these activities are essential for worship, is worship limited to them? Give some examples of other forms of worship. 4. Ellen G. White wrote in Steps to Christ, page 103, His service should not be looked upon as a heart-saddening, distressing exercise. It should be a pleasure to worship the Lord and to take part in His work. End of quote. How can worship of the Lord become a pleasure? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. No Hair But a Hat, Part 8 by Andrew McChesney. Sekule learned of two other Sabbath keepers in the military, a lieutenant preparing for baptism and an older man born in a Seventh-day Adventist home. The Bosnian War was raging and the lieutenant tried to convince Sekule that desperate times called for desperate measures. This is a special time and you have to eat what you have, he said. You can practice your religion after you leave the military, but now you have to eat for your health. Sekule decided that the lieutenant wasn't an Adventist. He was talking like Sekule's unbelieving parents and Sekule didn't want to eat meat. Sekule longed to meet the soldier born in an Adventist home. He wanted to ask for advice about what to eat, what to do if he were sent to the front, or just to pray together. He felt so alone. One day, someone pointed out the Adventist to Sekule in the mess hall. Sekule watched as the man sat down with a plate of pork sausages and brown beans fried in lard, removed the sausages and ate the beans. A struggling broke out inside Sekule. He's eating unclean food, he thought. Are you stupid? You've lost so much weight and you don't have strength because you don't want to eat anything. Look at him. He's smart. When you leave the military, you can eat whatever you want. Sukule took a step toward the serving line, and then he took another step. He wasn't hungry. He was famished after eating only bread with tea for 20 days. A few steps away from the food, he stopped. I won't take it, he thought. If God died for me, I will be faithful to him. After a few months, spring arrived and Sukule ate budding leaves on trees. He also ate grass that he knew was edible from his childhood. Four months into his military service, he left the barracks to eat his first meal with a spoon. An Adventist pastor invited him to his home for a meal. Not long after that, Sekule was sent to Serbia's capital, Belgrade, to serve under the military's top general. He was one of the best teleprinter typers in the country. He now barracked His new barracks were located only a 20-minute walk away from a Seventh-day Adventist seminary. In his new role, he was allowed to leave the barracks whenever he wanted to, and he ate vegetarian meals at the seminary nearly every day. Sekule believed God was rewarding his faithfulness. Sekule enjoyed good health in the military. Never once did he fall ill. He lost only his hair. He entered the military with hair and left with none. He says it was as if God was saying, If you are faithful to me, I will take care of you. Yes, you will have problems. Yes, you lost your hair. But it is not a problem. I have a hat for you. <laughs> 